ASMR purposes, it might just put you to sleep. Either way, um, I'm not sure exactly how long it's going to take to read through. I'm not going to read the stats. I'll ignore those parts and the citations, so that might make it go a bit faster. In general, my dissertation was much, much shorter than most people's, and that was by design. I chose a topic that had less literature on it on purpose, and because it was interesting to me. Um, and also, like, I didn't want it to be excessively long, if you know anything about myself and uh, my disdain for overly complicating things for no reason. I did not want to do that. I would love a piece of feedback from you guys, though. Um, I'm using my microphone that I normally just use for podcasting and recording videos that are not ASMR related. I want to know how it sounds. Does this work for you? Does this give you tingles? Um, in the same way that one of my other recording methods might, like using the 3 do microphone or the camera microphone or something like that. Let me know. So let's, uh, let's get into it. Um, my dissertation is called Factors Related to Preference for Online Psychological among active internet users. Cover it 2015. Um, I'm going to skip the acknowledgements in my CV. Uh, I'll go ahead and read the abstract. Internet based approaches to psychological treatment have risen in popularity and have been shown to be efficacious in treating a wide array of issues. The purpose of this study was to move beyond evaluation of treatment efficacy and instead identify the factors that might be related to a preference for these non-traditional modes of treatment, which is an essential aspect of rigorous behavioral research. Using an online survey, 14, 1,404 self-reported adults in the United States provided information about demographics and internet as well as measures of personality, depression, anxiety, and attitudes toward receiving help. Finally, the participants were instructed to watch three short video vignettes depicting face-to-face -face therapy, online guided self-help, and text-based internet psychotherapy before indicating their preferences for each modality. Results suggest that individuals who preferred either of the two online approaches had significantly lower extroversion, difficulty attending routine in-person meetings, more negative attitudes toward receiving help, and lower satisfaction with previous treatment than participants who preferred face-to-face -face therapy. It appears that there may be distinct factors that distinguish individuals with an interest in internet-based psychological treatment from those who prefer traditional the process of exploring these types, the types of people that are likely to be interested in internet-based psychological treatment. All right, so table of contents, you can see about how long it is there. And let's dive into it. Factors related to preference for online psychological treatments among active internet users. Approximately 74% of American adults actively use the internet. Given two random individuals from the United States, there are a few other qualities that they are more likely to have in common. To put this into perspective, these two hypothetical individuals are more likely to have internet use in common than their gender, and are just about as likely to both endorse Christianity as a religion over the past decade, internet-based interactions have become a primary source of interpersonal communication. Estimated figures on internet use characteristically change rapidly from year to year, but it is currently believed that approximately 65% of adults who engage, or who use the internet, engage in social networking through websites like Facebook. Taken with the fact that nearly 
nearly all individuals who actively use the internet send personal emails regularly and most engage in conversations through chat or instant messaging. It is important to not ignore the pervasiveness of internet media mediated interpersonal communication in the United States. Given that the majority of American adults use the internet for interpersonal communication as well as for convenient access to information, many individuals have begun to seek out sources of psychological help online. A simple internet search reveals results such as BetterHelp.com, OnlineTherapy.com, and Therapy.com, which claim to offer professional counseling and psychotherapy services over the internet. Because people are currently seeking out and undergoing internet-based counseling and psychotherapy, it is essential to understand what internet-based therapy looks like, how it may be beneficial for clients, and for whom in particular it might be appropriate. There exists a large and growing body of evidence to support the efficacy of internet-based alternatives to traditional psychotherapy, but there remains a dearth of information about what types of people engage in these online treatments. Treatment Gap in Psychotherapy Although psychotherapy has been shown to be beneficial for individuals suffering from a wide variety of issues, a portion of the population remains unwilling or unable to utilize the current model of psychological help, which results in a treatment gap between the prevalence of psychological disorders and the proportion of affected individuals who receive treatment. This treatment gap occurs for a wide variety of reasons, including lack of available services geographical isolation and perceived stigmatization regarding psychopathology or mental health services. Rates of treatment for many psychological disorders are low, and there often exist hidden populations of people who avoid seeking help due to experiences of shame or resulting from specific interpersonal characteristics. For instance, men with erectile dysfunction have been recognized as a population that is not likely to find treatment due to embarrassment, regardless of the fact that there are empirically validated psychotherapeutic methods of treating the disorder. Treatment for anxiety disorders can also be paradoxical in that the very issues that the individual living with anxiety must endure are also the issues that might prevent them from seeking mental health services. Indeed, it appears that less than 40% of individuals with anxiety access mental health services. Additionally, for some issues such as depression, not only are rates of seeking treatment low, but the barriers to typical psychotherapeutic treatment often lead to engagement in treatments that are less effective or altogether questionable. There are myriad reasons why one might avoid or feel uncomfortable to seek or feel unable to seek out psychological help. Concerns about stigmatization have been identified as one of the primary inhibiting factors in utilization of mental health services. In particular, those who have concerns about being stigmatized are much less likely to seek out psychotherapy to deal with mental illness. There are broadly two categories of stigma that have been identified and associated with mental health services public stigma and self-stigma. Public stigma refers to the perceptions endorsed by the general population that a person who seeks therapy or mental health services is socially unacceptable. The related construct of self-stigma is defined as the reduction in a person's self-esteem due to their own perception that they are socially unacceptable. In addition to public perception of certain disorders and illnesses, culture plays an important role in an individual's sense of stigmatization. For instance, studies have shown that self-concealment of mental health issues is particularly prevalent among young adults that identify as African American. Asian, Asian American, and Pacific Islander populations have also been shown to have differentially lower rates of mental health service utilization than European American populations despite higher rates of depression and anxiety. In addition to ethnicity and other 
In addition to ethnicity, other subcultures, such as members of the armed forces and college students, have demonstrated significant self-stigmatization that leads to underutilization of therapy and other psychological treatments. Given the treatment gap in the field of mental health and the variety of factors that influence the perception of stigmatization among people suffering from mental illness, it is reasonable to suspect that there may be a particular population of individuals who might not otherwise seek psychotherapeutic treatment but might be willing to engage in treatments that occur over the internet where they maintain a certain level of relative anonymity in terms of outward appearance and culture. History of internet-based treatment. <coughs> Available through the internet. It is helpful to categorize 
them by the intensity of contact with the clinician, as well as by the synchronicity of communication. As shown in Table 1, synchronous communication involves a live back-and-forth exchange between two or more individuals, which is characteristic of in-person conversation or instant text chatting. Asynchronous communication is marked by a delay in transmission between the communicating individuals, such as that seen in traditional post or email. In their asynchronous internet-based psychodynamic treatment of individuals with depression, Johansson et al. gave participants gradual access to self-help modules while providing therapist support via a secure email program throughout the internet, throughout the treatment process. Similarly, Perini et al. developed an internet-based treatment for major depression called the Sadness Program. This treatment involves online lessons, weekly homework assignments, and asynchronous weekly contact with mental health professionals through email. Another treatment called the Anxiety Program was developed by Titov et al and is comprised of online lessons, homework assignments, reminder emails, and asynchronous messaging contact with the clinician. A notable example of the synchronous model of treatment is Kessler et al.'s trial of internet-delivered psychotherapy for depression, in which participants were administered 55-minute CBT sessions administered by therapists through real-time instant messaging. This is similar to the instant messaging-based intervention provided through the website psychologyonline.co.uk, in which clients book and attend virtual text-based psychotherapy sessions with a therapist over the internet. Finally, internet-based psychotherapy models can be divided into interventions with a large degree of therapist involvement and those with relatively little involvement. Titov broadly defines low-intensity low intensity interventions as those that involve less than three hours of total therapist contact, and high-intensity interventions as those that involve more than three hours of contact. By nature, most interventions that include synchronous contact with therapists in the form of live sessions are high-intensity. There are some exceptions to this because certain treatments involve shorter sessions, and might total less than three hours, thus qualifying as low-intensity interventions. In some cases, self-guided therapy experiences can be combined with periodic synchronous client-therapist interactions as a means of ensuring mastery of the lessons, while only requiring a relatively small amount of therapist time. Interventions involving asynchronous contact can also be categorized using this metric by indicating a standard amount of time that clinicians are allotted to respond to online forum posts or send response emails to clients. Table 1 demonstrates how different online treatments might fall within these different categories. So, high-intensity synchronous modality would be real-time instant messaging, therapy with long sessions, high-intensity asynchronous would be self-help modules with extensive clinician feedback or forum participation, low-intensity synchronous would be real-time instant message therapy with brief sessions, asynchronous low-intensity would be self-help modules with minimal clinician contact. Empirical support for treatment for internet-based treatments. Although the field of internet-based psychotherapy is in its infancy, the extant literature on the topic suggests that it is efficacious. Titov reviewed 13 studies investigating the effects of internet-based therapy, psychotherapy for depression. This review summarized the between-group effect sizes at post-treatment for both high- and low-intensity interventions that were either self-guided or therapist-guided. Results indicated that guided internet-based interventions for depression are efficacious, as if it is evidenced by within-group effect sizes in excess of 1.0 on measures of depression. This effect size is similar to that.
I've achieved through face-to-face -face psychotherapy, and the results were typically sustained on follow-up. Similar results were noted between high-intensity guided interventions and low-intensity guided interventions. This is in contrast to their findings on self-guided therapies, which suggest lower improvements than guided interventions and lower overall completion rates. Kessler et al. combined a randomized controlled trial of an online therapist delivered treatment for depression in a primary care setting. Oh, completed a randomized controlled trial. The authors noted that despite the demonstrated efficacy of online self-help treatments for depression, they remain inflexible and difficult to tailor to the individual patient's needs, which may contribute to low rates of adherence. The participants in the study were 297 individuals in primary care that were recruited from 55 general practices in the United Kingdom. To be included, participants had to be adults with a new episode of depression diagnosed within four weeks of the referral. The intervention consisted of up to 10 55-minute cognitive behavioral therapy CBT, sessions delivered online in real time by a therapist via instant messaging. Participants in the intervention group were more likely to have recovered from depression at four months follow-up than were those in the control group. This finding also persisted at eight months follow-up. These results support the notion that internet-delivered psychotherapy for depression may be efficacious and feasible in a primary care setting. In a follow-up to their 2008 pilot study, Perini, Titov, and Andrews investigated the efficacy of an internet-based intervention called the Sadness Program. Participants were 45 Australian individuals who met diagnostic criteria for major depression and were randomly assigned to the Sadness Program or a weightless control group. Treatment consisted of six online lessons, homework assignments, participation in an online discussion forum, and regular email contact with the clinician. The online lessons were designed to represent principles used in CBT and were presented in the form of an illustrated story about a woman with depression who, with the help of her therapist, learns how to gain control over her symptoms. This intervention could be considered a high-intensity asynchronous treatment. Univariate and COVAs on post-treatment outcome measures for depression showed that the treatment group had significantly lower post-treatment scores than the control group. Additionally, at post-treatment, 41% of the treatment group participants were classified as recovered which is a reduction in pretreatment PHQ-9 scores of at least 50%, compared to 6% of the control group participants. These data provide additional support for the efficacy of therapist-supported self-help programs delivered over the Internet. In another randomized controlled trial, Johnson et al. examined the efficacy of a transdiagnostic Internet-based CBT program for anxiety disorders. Participants were 139 individuals living in Australia who met DSM-4 diagnostic criteria for generalized anxiety disorder, social phobia, or panic disorder. The treatment was referred to as the Enhanced Anxiety Program and included eight online lessons, homework assignments, weekly telephone or email contact with the clinician, and regulated and regular automated reminder emails. Weekly therapist contact was limited to 10 minutes, which resulted in a total of less than two hours per participant, low intensity. Univariate and COVAs revealed significant differences between the treatment group and weightless control group on seven separate outcome measures. Large between group effect sizes were achieved in this comparison. The results of this study illustrate that low-intensity, asynchronous guided CBT treatment delivered through the internet may be effective in significantly reducing symptoms of anxiety. In a randomized controlled trial, Blinkers, Coder, and Shippers compared the effectiveness of internet-based therapy and internet-based self-help for problematic alcohol use 
officers versus whitelist control group. Participants were adults recruited through a substance abuse treatment center based in the Netherlands who scored over 8 on the alcohol use disorders identification test, or audit, and drank more than 14 standard drinks per week. The self-help group utilized a program based on CBD and motivational interviewing. The program was developed in Adobe Flash and is a text-based interactive means for delivering lessons. Participants in the therapy group adhere to treatment that is based on the same CBD slash MI protocol, but was extended to include synchronous text-based chat session with a therapist. These sessions lasted 40 minutes each. Planned pairwise comparisons indicated that both therapy and self-help conditions drink significantly less per week at three months follow-up than the waitlist group. The difference between therapy and self-help groups was not significant at three months follow-up. At six months, this difference was significant. In sum, these findings suggest that online self-help and online synchronous therapy may both significantly reduce problem, problem drinking in adult alcohol abusers, and that online therapy may be more effective at reducing problem drinking than online self-help over time. Psychodynamic treatment is less commonly translated into internet-delivered therapy, although it appears to be efficacious in some instances. Johansson et al. conducted a randomized controlled trial of a 10-week online psychodynamic guided self-help treatment for depression, for adult depression. The authors indicate that there is a population of individuals who prefer psychodynamic treatment over CBT, which is more common, which is the more common online treatment at the moment. Participants were 92 adults from Sweden who were diagnosed with major depression. Participants were given gradual access to nine self-help modules, as well as online support from a therapist as needed through a secure email service. The overall focus of treatment was on teaching the client how to recognize and break unhelpful, affective, cognitive, and behavioral patterns. The individuals receiving psychodynamic treatment displayed continuous within-group improvements throughout the trial as measured by the BDI-2 pre-treatment, post-treatment, at and at a 10-month follow-up. The different <laughs> the between-group effect size at post-treatment was large. There was also a significant interaction effect of group and time on the BDI-2. Taken together, these findings show that guided self-help may be an effective treatment for depression and that it is possible to deliver this treatment over the internet. In an attempt to fortify the empirical support for online treatment of psychological disorders, Beattie et al. conducted a qualitative study investigating the expectations and experiences of primary care patients involved in online cognitive behavioral therapy for depression. The authors note that a majority of people who are diagnosed with depression in the United Kingdom are treated within a primary care context, but claim that the availability of high-quality counseling within primary care is limited. To this end, the authors sought to add to the body of literature investigating online psychological treatments within the primary care setting as an alternative to traditional options. The participants were 24 patients in England with depression who were involved in a parallel clinical trial of online CBT administered in real time by psychotherapists. The intervention was administered through the website psychologyonline.co.uk. Semi-structured interviews were conducted with participants in their homes using a flexible topic guide. Pre-therapy interviews explored expectations of online CBD, and post-therapy interviews examined actual experiences. Most participants accessed the online treatment from their home computer and found this to be a major advantage in terms of convenience and ability to schedule sessions into their daily lives. Prior to beginning therapy, many participants revealed negative expectations in regards to developing a therapeutic relationship 
relationship with the clinician over the internet and intuitively held a preference for face-to-face -face communication. However, after the treatment was completed, most were able to establish a good relationship and several reported being surprised at how quickly rapport was developed. Additionally, participants who felt more comfortable with writing down thoughts and feelings or communicating online in general had more positive expectations and reported outcomes. Also, many participants who had reservations about typing instead of talking were able to fully engage when treatment occurred. This research supports the idea that online psychotherapy may be an attractive option to customers. Overall, it is clear that the extent research on the subject of internet-delivered mental health interventions indicates that treatments can be efficacious in treating psychological disorders. However, the field of online psychotherapy is still in its early stages and in the United States, internet-based interventions are not yet widely considered to be empirically supported treatments. Regardless of the apparent benefits of online psychological treatment versus traditional face-to-face -face treatment, additional research is required to clarify the portrait of someone who might seek out internet-based mental health treatment. In other words, who are the likely candidates for internet-based psychological intervention? Stage Model of Behavioral Research Onkin et al. proposed a stage model for behavioral therapies in recognition of the large burden placed on individual investigators who intend to conduct methodologically rigorous research. This model has three components that span the entire process, from the initial clinical idea to the late-stage effectiveness research. Stage 1 consists of basic feasibility and pilot testing, development of manuals, creation of competence measures, and other aspects that are related to a novel clinical innovation. Stage 2 consists of randomized clinical trials, or RCTs, to examine the efficacy of manualized or pilot-tested treatments that demonstrate promise. Finally, Stage 3 consists of research designed to evaluate generalizability, implementation issues, consumer issues, and other aspects related to the transportability of efficacious treatments. In Runsonville, Carroll, and Onkin's Guide to in Runsonville, Carol and Onkin's Guide to Moving Past Stage 1 in Behavioral Research. The authors note that it is crucial to recognize that the scientific study of behavioral therapies does not finish with the completion of valid RCDs. Rather, Stage 3 is essential for the process of bridging the gap between research and clinical practice. In order to move into Stage 3, the treatment must have demonstrated efficacy in at least two RCDs. As demonstrated previously, there are many completed RCDs on various forms of internet-based psychotherapy, which indicate that on the whole, it is an efficacious mode of treatment. However, it appears that the literature currently has little to offer in terms of information regarding the generalizability, feasibility, or desirability of internet-based treatments. Now that RCTs have established that internet-based therapies are efficacious, the next, the next logical step is for the field to begin stage 3 research to investigate the effectiveness and generalizability of such interventions. The purpose of the present study is to identify which personality characteristics, symptom profiles, and personal aspects are related to a preference for internet-based psychotherapy. This research will enable clinicians and future researchers to better understand which particular populations are more likely to have an interest in, and I think that's a typo, to, or are more likely to have an interest in, in internet-based psychotherapy. <laughs> Since the current profile of an optimal patient for this new mode of intervention is largely unknown, Research questions and hypotheses. The primary objective of this study is to determine whether there is a particular subset of individuals who might be uniquely drawn to internet-based psychotherapy. 
processes. One, individuals who prefer either of the internet-based approaches will be less extroverted than those who prefer face-to-face -face treatment. Two, individuals who prefer either of the internet-based approaches will endorse a greater amount of anxiety and depression than those who prefer face-to-face -face treatment. Three, individuals who have had negative experiences with prior psychological treatment will prefer internet-based approaches over face-to-face -face therapy. Four, individuals who indicate an inability to consistently attend weekly appointments will demonstrate a preference for internet-based treatment over face-to-face -face therapy. Five, individuals with negative attitudes toward receiving help from others will demonstrate a greater preference for internet-based approaches than face-to-face -face treatment. Method Participants Similar to other internet researchers such as Balsam, Lehavut, I don't know if they have Bateness, and Sergo, I use targeted sampling as well as snowball sampling to gather participants. Snowball sampling refers to the practice of encouraging participants to invite further participation from their own personal networks. Participants were conducted over the internet during a one-month period starting March 14, 2014. I contacted initial participants for the study through a variety of internet-based means, including direct email to personal connections, posts on Facebook.com, Twitter.com, LinkedIn.com, and YouTube.com, as well as posts to online message boards. Participants were given a direct link to the study and were encouraged to share this link via social media with their own connections in order to propagate the survey beyond the researcher's personal network. To facilitate this, the final page of the survey contained three large social sharing buttons, which directed the participants to share the survey link on Facebook, Twitter, or through email. In order to participate in the study, the participants were required to be United States residents over the age of 18. The first two questions of the survey were designed to screen out participants who did not fit this criteria. Therefore, any participants that indicated they were under the age of 18 or did not reside in the United States were thanked for their interest and directed away from the survey. In total, 3,388 individuals responded to the survey. 365 potential participants were screened out due to not being current residents of the United States. Of the remaining potential participants, 99 were screened out due to being under the age of 18. Additionally, many participants dropped out partway through the study. 90 participants discontinued the survey after completing the demographic portion, and another 524 participants stopped responding prior to completing the questionnaires on personality symptoms and attitudes toward receiving help. These participants were not included in the analyses. Due to the fundamental importance of the ratings toward the end of the survey, which measured the participants' preferences regarding the three tre different treatment modalities, any participants who did not complete these items were not included in the analyses. The resultant sample contained 1,404 individuals. The participants reported being predominantly female and European American. The mean reported age of the participants was 27.7. 33% of the participants had completed some college coursework, and 57% lived in a suburban area. There were no significant differences between gender or ethnicity groups in terms of overall preference for an internet-based versus face-to-face -face approaches. I read that wrong. There were no significant differences between gender or ethnicity groups in terms of overall preference for internet-based versus face-to-face -face approaches. Compared to the subset of the sample who completed the introductory portion of the survey but did not continue on to the questionnaires, the final sample did not differ greatly in terms of demographics. The group that dropped out had a slightly lower mean age of 24.54 evenly split in terms of gender, had a similar distribution of education level, and were predominantly European American. Instruments. Background information. I gathered extended demographic information about participants through a self-report questionnaire. This portion
portion of the study asked participants to provide their age, ethnicity, level of education, ability to attend meetings, number of individuals in the household, and approximate household income. Participants were also asked about their history of psychological and psychopharmacological treatment. Finally, participants provided information about their current computer and internet use. Personality factors. I used the Big Five Inventory, BFI, to achieve a basic understanding of each participant's personality characteristics. The BFI is a 44-item measure of five basic personality factors, neuroticism, extroversion, openness, agreeableness, and conscientiousness, collectively referred to as the Big Five. It is a self-report assessment in which individuals are asked to indicate the extent to which they agree or disagree with statements about themselves using a five-point Likert scale. The assessment takes approximately five minutes to complete and has sound psychometric properties. In adult samples, the BFI has demonstrated high internal consistency, adequate test retest reliability, and strong convergence with other measures of big five traits. Research has also shown a high degree of agreement between the self and peer reports using the BFI. Symptoms The Self-Rating Anxiety Scale, SAS, is a 20-item self-report measure designed to measure commonly found characteristics of anxiety disorders, including five affective and 15 somatic symptoms. Each item is rated on a four-point Likert scale, indicating the degree to which each item applies to the rater during the past week. The SAS is scored by summing the values on each item to produce a total raw score, ranging from 20 to 80. The author suggests a cutoff score of 50 for detecting the presence of clinically meaningful anxiety. The original literature indicates significant correlations with the Taylor Manifest Anxiety Scale and with a companion scale designed for clinician ratings of patient anxiety. In two subsequent studies with college-age samples, Crumbox coefficient alphas were both 0.82. The internal consistency for the SAS responses in the present study as measured by Crumbox alpha was 0.89, which represents good consistency. The self-rating depression scale SDS is a 20-item instrument designed to investigate three dimensions of depression, pervasive affect, physiological non-committants, and psychological concomitants. Each item is rated on a four-point Likert scale, indicating how often each symptom applies to the rater. The SDS is scored by summing the values from each item to generate a raw score ranging from 20 to 80. Sung suggests individual items as well as overall scores are considered meaningful. It indicates the following cutoff scores. 50 to 59, mild to moderate. 60 to 69, moderate to severe. 70 and over, severe. The SDS has been shown to have adequate psychometrics in the original literature with a split half reliability of 0.73 good concurrent validity with other depression measures such as the Beck Depression Inventory. Another study of the SDS with an elderly population demonstrated high internal consistency of 0.84. The Chromebox Alpha for the SDS responses of this study was 0.87, which indicates good internal consistency. These basic symptom measures are not intended to serve a diagnostic function. They were used to understand the general symptomatic patterns of depression and anxiety that are present in the sample and to serve as a basis of comparison for the between groups. Likelihood to seek help. The Network Orientation Scale, or NOS, is a 20-item instrument designed to measure a construct called negative network orientation which refers to the perspective that it, is un, that it is useless, risky, or unwise to seek help from others. An important aspect of the NOS
does is that it does not focus on an individual's lack of social support as a phenomenon, but rather their unwillingness to maintain or utilize those supports. In other words, the individual may have a large and supported personal network, but may harbor a personal belief that they should not rely on it. The NOS was initially developed <laughs> I have a lot of typos, I guess. The NOS was initially developed initially <laughs> for college age and one community adult sample. Each of these samples were ethnically and culturally varied. The NOS has demonstrated good internal consistency with mean alpha of 0.74 and test retest correlations of 0 0.85, 0 0.87, and 0.81 for one, two, and three week intervals respectively. have been shown to correlate with reports of less available network supports and more negative appraisals of support. The Chromebox Alpha for the NOS responses from the present study was 0.84, which can be considered good internal consistency. Therapy Impressions I measured participants' therapy impressions by instructing them to view three short video vignettes each depicting a different type of therapy, and then asking them to respond to self-report items that were intended to measure the participants' preferences and impressions of each, each therapy type. These videos were hosted privately on YouTube and feature a young woman named Jenny. Jenny was presented as an apparently Caucasian female in her mid-30s in a heterosexual marriage with multiple children. The three vignettes consist of a sequence of color illustrations depicting Jenny engaging in one of the three therapeutic modalities, along with a voiceover describing the situation. In all of the vignettes, Jenny suffers from the same presenting issue, though each is worded slightly differently. The transcripts for the voiceovers are included in the appendices. Each vignette was embedded in a separate page of the survey, which asked the participants to please watch the following video before answering the questions below. The text-based internet psychotherapy vignette depic depicted Jenny getting home from somewhere in her car, greeting her dog at the door upon entering home, excusing herself from the dinner table where she is sitting with her family, and sitting on the couch with her laptop. An example instant message was also shown on the screen of the computer in which Jenny's therapist begins the session by asking her about a previously mentioned evaluation at work. The final scene in the text-based internet psychotherapy vignette was a picture of the secure transaction service where Jenny pays for her session. The guided self-help vignette depicted Jenny going to a coffee shop and ordering a coffee sitting down with her laptop at a table, completing an online module titled Anxiety Scheduling. <gasps> Emailing her homework to her therapist and finally paying through the same secure transaction service. The traditional psychotherapy vignette showed Jenny walking into a psychotherapist office, sitting in the waiting room, being greeted by her therapist and sitting down to talk with her therapist in a private office, and finally paying for her session by credit card. I decided to include the depiction of Jenny paying for her treatment by credit card or through the secure transaction service in order to illustrate that the three approaches were equivalent in their value. In other words, to demonstrate that the internet-based approaches were not held to a lower standard than the face-to-face -face treatment. It is possible that financial status might have influenced participant ratings of the different approaches if one was perceived to be less expensive. Below each of the video vignettes, participants were asked to rate five Likert scale ratings indicating their opinions of the therapeutic modality presented on that page. <sighs> okay, I'm really tired. I thought I was going to make it through this, but I'm only on page 18 and uh, there's still quite a bit to go. So let's resume this pretty soon.
procedures. Yeah, we'll pick up at procedures. <laughs> 